template on this computer. Yeah. Um, so the idea with this webinar is really to give you an idea of what's happening within the project, of the expert that we have, but also to create a little bit of a discussion because we really like to have this strong community that can share and discuss and, and learn from each other. Um, we had quite a bit of videos and, and, and uh, episodes on the different approaches of the project, specifically on the different anim uh, non-traditional animals that have been used. So one of Daphnia, one of Sea Elegans, one of Zebrafish, Drosophila, Xeno uh, well, Xenopus we're going to do it now, uh, cell human cell line. And of course, we were missing the last one, which was the Xenopus. And finally, we're going to manage to uh, finish this little series with the episode that we have today. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have a really existential question that is going to take quite a long time to apply, you can wait till the end. It's going to have a question, a Q&A session at the end of the talk. If there is something you want to ask while the presentation is going because you're missing something, feel free to, to uh, either asking or maybe just uh, raise your hand and I will check it with, uh, with Andrew. Uh, otherwise, well, enjoy the presentation. Uh, I keep you in the in the capable hands uh, and voice of uh, Dr. Andrew Trindal, which is coming from Watchfog, Laboratory uh, Watchfog, which is one of the partners of Precision Talks, uh, and is going to talk about uh, Xenopus and how it can be used in many different approaches uh, in, in life science and toxicology. So, Andrew, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to to um, enlighten you all a little bit about Xenopus, but um, uh, also just to, to switch off my emails for a moment. So um, I'm going to jump right in and I'll start sharing the presentation. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I'm assuming everyone can see the presentation. Okay, just um, uh, give Matteo a shout if you can. <laughs> He'll do something. Uh, it works, um, it works. Yeah, okay, great. So um, let me just move the control bar so I can see what I'm doing. Um, okay, so uh, the presentation is titled uh, Xenopus Lavis, a uh, fully aquatic tetrapod. Um, and... Um, I think that's important to to um, kind of keep in mind the positioning of um, Xenopus um, as the only tetrapod, um, apart from the the human cell lines, obviously um, in the uh, in the project. Um, so I'm going to start off by introducing Xenopus. Some of you will be aware of it, but hopefully um, you'll you'll learn a few new things anyway. And then I'll move on to um, some of the um, ecotox applications and models, and some of the uh, human health models. So um, just to give you an idea first um, of um, the uh, the kind of diversity of the amphibians, um, I mean, there's three um, main um, orders of amphibians. Um, so there's the Anura, uh, the, uh, which are the tailless frogs. There's the Uridella, uh, salamanders and axolotls, um, and similar, um, similar amphibians, which... Um, fail to go through metamorphosis so they've adapted to uh, stay in a, in a more or less larval form uh, and Eurodilla um, actually means tailed and then there's the uh, apoda uh, or gymnophones, gymnophones uh, which uh, look very much like something between a worm and a snake and, and are actually the uh, um, the amphibians that have lost or almost entirely lost their feet um, they're also gymniophones, um, actually means eyeless ones. So um, in most cases, they've more or less lost um, eyesight as well. So we're going to be concentrating on the annua, um, which is the uh, the order that Xenopus belong to. Um, so the annuans are tailless amphibians, as I said. Uh, they can live large distances from water. Um, generally, they lay eggs, but some give birth to live young as well. Um, it's, uh, I mean, there's already a, a huge variety uh, just within the annuan class. Um, the back legs have been adapted to locomotion by jumping, uh, which we'll all be familiar with. And actually, these are the, the you know, when we think of frogs, these are the, the frogs that we most think of. And they're present in almost all types of the parts of the world. 
Um, so, I mean, you know, the, all the frogs, toads, tree frogs, clawed frogs that, that you may know or be friends with um, will belong to uh, the Anurin uh, order. So um, moving on to Xenopus lavis specifically, um, it was first described in 1803 by F.M. Dorden um, as the smooth toad. And lavis actually means smooth, uh, which is where the name comes from. Uh, Xenopus is Greek for alien foot. And this is where their other name comes from, the African clawed toad. Um, so um, they, they do have claws on their back feet and the back feet are large and completely um, webbed to, to help them to swim in the water. So originally they were called Buffo Lavis or um, the smooth toad. Uh, the name was then changed later to Xenopus Lavis. And um, the image that you can see, um, see uh, can you see the cursor or should I do a thing? Uh, move it again. I don't see it right now. Yeah, uh, I can see it. Yes, yes, yes. You can see it. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, um, the image you can see here is actually the first um, known drawing of Xenopus. I'm sure there were others before, um, back in prehistory, but um, but um, this is the first known image uh, by Dorden in 1802. So, uh, as I said, they've got several names, Cape Xenopus, Smooth Xenopus, Platana, African Clawed Toad. Um, and within this family, uh, the Pipidae family, there's um, four genesis. Uh, there's Pippa, Hymenochirus, uh, Pseudohymenochirus, and Xenopus. Um, all of these are tongueless amphibians. Um, so they they help, they they facilitate swallowing by uh, moving their eyeballs down into the uh, buccal cavity, uh, pushing the food down with the base of their eyeballs. Um, and they all have completely webbed feet and a lateral line. So this lateral line is important. Um, and um, it actually helps them to, um, to sense uh, disturbances in the water, which helps them to, um, if it, um, to avoid predators and also to... Um, to sense water flow, uh, which they're very sensitive to. So um, placing them in a kind of phylogenetic tree, you can see that um, we've got Xenopus here, um, and they're actually, um, you know, separated from um, from uh, the insects way back and then from the fish uh, about 450 million years ago. Um, and then, um, this uh, the kind of proto Xenopus separated uh, 360 million years ago into uh, the avians and um, and the amphibians. So, uh, relatively speaking, compared to many other model organisms, or at least the non mammalian ones, um, they're relatively close to humans. Um, so, just a quick, brief bit of kind of his life history of uh, Xenopus. So um, on the left, you can see the, uh, actually, uh, yeah, this is still in French. <laughs> I'm sure you'll work it out. But the uh, geographic distribution um, of the different species uh, in Africa, uh, with Lavis Lavis being down here uh, on the Cape. Um, and then you've got an example here of the kind of habitat they're living. So this is in a lake in Uganda. And here you can actually see some some guys um, ca uh, catching uh, Xenopus. Um, in the nature reserve close to Cape Town. So these are the kind of uh, muddy ponds or pools uh, which they'll live in. And they'll actually vary greatly in size and salinity at different times in the year, um, as they'll obviously dry up uh, considerably during the dry season. Uh, we should also keep in mind that when we say Xenopus, um, I'm going to talk specifically about Xenopus lavis, but Xenopus is a whole family uh, or a whole genus of um, highly aquatic frogs. And um, I mean, there are many members of the Xenopus genus. Uh, I mean, these are just four examples here. Um, so you've got Xenopus lavis, which is um, huge compared to most of the others. And the other well-known model, uh, Xenopus tropicalis, here on the left for comparison. So uh, moving on to reproductive biology, um, then this is a male. Um, he's got hold of a female um, around the waist from behind, um, which is um, which is what they do. Um, 
and then you can collect them. Um, this is actually a semi-natural um, reproduction, um, semi in the sense that uh, generally the two fish, the male and the female, or at very least the female are primed uh, with hormones to induce uh, reproductive behavior and egg laying. Um, and so uh, the, when these eggs are collected, then there'll be hundreds or thousands of eggs from one laying, um, but they'll be relatively asynchronous. Um, so uh, for work at later developmental stages, this isn't really an issue. They might just be out by a few hours. Um, but obviously for work at very early uh, stages, um, um, you know, and studying um, or collecting embryos for, for in situ, then um, it's better to do an in vitro fertilization, which you can see on the right here, uh, where everything will obviously be completely synchronized to within a few seconds. And then, um, say in the audience, I'm sure um, most of you are already aware of the life cycle of uh, Xenopus or amphibians in general, but just a quick reminder um, that um, the eggs will be laid. There's um, a huge amount of division that goes on very quickly, uh, just in a few hours um, to get to gastrula stages. And I mean, this is the first time that uh, cell cycle checks will come in. Um, up until that point, the eggs actually dividing faster than bacteria. Um, just to try and get as advanced as possible. And so um, apoptosis and, and cell cycle checks will start kicking in around gastrulation. Um, then uh, the next big step would be neurulation, uh, where the notochords formed, um, and then uh, gradual development of the organs and, um, and development into uh, late embryo and tadpole stages uh, before, obviously, metamorphosing, metamorphosing and um, becoming a juvenile frog. So it's defined for Xenopus as 66 stages, with 66 being uh, the adult form in a juvenile, um, and uh, the first stage being um, the fertilized egg. So, I mean, that's interesting to keep in mind because um, then we can sort of position ourselves on here and talk about some of the, the ethical advantages of working with the early stages. So um, as you can see here, you've got the egg stages, the embryonic stages, um, and then the eleutheroembryonic stages here, um, and tadpole stages and late tadpole stages, prometamorphic stages, um, and uh, then after metamorphosis, maturation into the adult size and, and uh, full function. Um, so what's interesting here is uh, this embryonic period, um, they are not considered as... Um, uh, laboratory animals uh, in Europe. Uh, this is, these are the embryonic and the luthero-embryonic stages. And by luthero-embryonic stages, we mean uh, the life stages where they're, uh, they're not fully independent, where they are um, still um, subsisting on um, energy reserves um, in the vitellus, which are deposited in the eggs um, uh, maternally. Um, and then after this transition, when they start um, uh, requiring um, external food and they start um, swimming and, and um, incorporating um, external food. Um, at this stage, they become protected under law. Uh, this is the same for, for fish as well in, in Europe. So um, these having access to these very early stages where obviously with the fertilization um, um, happening externally, then it's very easy to collect these stages at very, you know, just after fertilization or even before, um, and to uh, have full access to um, to the embryos during these life stages. The fact that they're also very transparent at these life tr stages means as well that um, yeah, a lot of visualization can be done um, of either markers or just uh, organ development um, at, at these life stages um, in, in living embryos. So uh, the tadpole life stages, um, the capture of oxygen uh, is from the bucopharyngeal cavity, the gills, and also the skin. Uh, the gill filters are simultaneously used for uh, breathing and also for capturing food. Um, and what's important at this, uh, one of the things that's important at these stages is the inflation of the lungs, um, which is important for normal metamorphosis. And this is actually a really interesting example of uh, developmental plasticity. 
um, because it's been shown that um, if you uh, if you raise tadpoles in an environment where they don't have oxygen uh, access to um, gaseous oxygen and they can only breathe uh, oxygen in the water, um, then they'll actually retain they'll retain their gills and the ability to breathe um, the um, uh, the, the oxygen in the water they'll have very underdeveloped lungs and sometimes no lungs at all um, and this is really um, you know a fascinating um, example of developmental plasticity but also gives some insights into how um, some of the forms of amphibians which have remained entirely aquatic and don't develop lungs um, how that might have come about um, early on Um, what's interesting as well is uh, that you know they're well known for their gregarious behavior they'll uh, they'll swim in schools or um, and remain uh, fairly tightly packed at, at early tadpole stages um, the, the a group of tadpoles uh, for information can be called a school and not an army or a cloud I think clouds quite quite um, quite visual uh, when you've actually seen them do this but you know school works as well um the eyes and lateral line are used to calibrate the space between them at these stages um and it's very important what density they're reared at or what density they find themselves at um in 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 the wild um as this can have a big impact on uh, um their survival but also um you know the speed at which they'll develop so moving on to xenopus as a model organism um just a brief um, overview of some of the advantages. Um, so, as I said, thousands of transparent larvae, um, potentially from, from an egg laying, at least hundreds, but generally thousands. Um, they can be easily placed in contact with the sample because they're fully aquatic. Um, you know, I'm talking specifically about tadpole stages, but I mean the adults as well, although uh, uh, we, we stick to the tadpole stages. Um, the tests are rapid and concentration response um, experiments we can uh, you know we can put different concentrations of the of the chemical to be tested in the water and get um, as we would expect um, a variable response depending on the concentration um, and also the larvae are very small so we can manipulate them in six wall plates 96 wall plates um, these kind of um, uh, setups rather than having to use aquarium or aquarium like in um, test with um, adult fish or amphibians. This also makes them very low cost. And just a little picture to make things more interesting on the bottom. So um, you can see, um, you know, a normal light image of a tadpole's head and the tail here, or well, the start of the tail here. Um, and here you can see the same thing uh, under blue light. So this one's expressing GFB in the brain and in the uh, olfactive bulbs. and. I would imagine if you zoom in, probably the nerve between the two as well. Oh yeah, and uh, this is just to give you an idea of scale. So this is a five cent uh, uh, European or well, Euro coin. Uh, so um, as some of you may be aware, uh, Xenopus were used as a pregnancy test at one point. Um, I'm just gonna mention this briefly, but um, I think, um, I think it's worth going a bit more into depth of uh, the guy who invented this. So um, traditionally, they were used as food or an aphrodisiac. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, people were mainly looking at uh, the atomic, uh, anatomical description and tax taxonomical research. Uh, from 1930 onwards, uh, this guy, Lancelot Hogman, uh, developed a, um, a pregnancy test where you inject the urine from a, from a woman under the skin of a xenopus, um, a xenopus female, and five to 12 hours later, if she's pregnant, it'll lay eggs. So it was much more rapid than, than other sort of similar tests uh, which existed at the time using, uh, using mice, for example. Um, what's interesting, there is some controversy about whether he actually invented the test. Um, some of his students claimed they invented the test and all he did was invent, come up with the idea and prove that you could in, detect human chorionic gonadotropin uh, from women's urine by, uh, by injecting it under the skin of Xenopus. 
Um, so I, I don't know who's right there, but I don't see much as of a utility for detecting human coronary um from a woman's urine if it's not to find out if she's pregnant or not. But um, but what is interesting about this guy, I think it's worth going a little bit more into detail just briefly, because um, this quite this guy's quite interesting from a precision tox point of view. Um, and he actually spent some time at the University of Birmingham as a professor. Um, he worked in various different fields, um, you know, more or less related to biology. But before coming up with this um, this test um, for as a pregnancy test, he was working on um, in South Africa and the um, adaptive camouflage coloring in Xenopus, where they can actually um, change color from, you know, almost white to almost black. Uh, depending on uh, the lighting um, in the room. And in the wild, they'll be quite greeny brown to, to match um, the kind of foliage in the, the kind of murky waters that they'll live in. Um, and, um, and Lancelot stayed there until um, he left you to uh, apparently being uh, uncomfortable with um, the kind of apartheid situation over there. Um, but while he was working over there, he discovered the essential role of pituitary hormones um, in this camouflage coloring in Xenopus. Um, and so, you know, st really start being one of the first people to, to kind of really interest themselves in the kind of gene environment interaction, which uh, I think is quite relevant to precision tox where, um, you know, through transcriptomics and metabolomics, we're we're studying the the reaction of the genes to to environmental stimuli. Um, he was also the first person to use gene environment interactions to argue against uh, what was being proposed at the time, which was statistical approaches for considering uh, genetics and environmental factors as independent, or uh, to put it another way, to consider nature and nurture as two independent things which couldn't influence each other. And um, so, so yeah, I think for you know the this this guy you know maybe would have agreed with the uh, a precision tox style um strategy but um i'm just going to leave you with a quote of his and i'm not going to comment on it but i'll just let you draw what you want but you know it's an interesting quote uh, in 1950 he's famous for saying i like scandinavians skiing swimming and socialists who realize it's our business to promote social progress by peaceful methods I dislike football, economists, eugenicists, fascists, Stalinists, and Scottish conservatives. I think that sex is necessary and bankers are not. So moving back to um, Xenopus, um, and, and Xenopus is a model organism, um, probably the first thing that comes to mind to many people when we talk about amphibians is thyroid hormones. Um, thyroid hormones are absolutely essential uh, for um, for metamorphosis. Uh, there's a peak, as you can see here, T3, the most active form of thyroid hormone, uh, peaks um, just, uh, you know, in, it starts going up in the, in, uh, in the plasma, uh, increasing in concentration as metamorphosis really starts to kick in uh, uh, in the late stage 50s. And then it peaks uh, at what we call metamorphic climax when, you know, the really most, obvious um, signs of metamorphosis growing um, uh, back legs and front legs uh, the tail regressing um, you know changing shape of the head and the body change of um, the gastrointestinal tract to uh, to be able to accommodate the the new food types that the the frog will be eating compared to the tadpole uh, the growth of the lungs rather than uh, to replace the gills when all this is happening t3 is um, really uh, peaking and then it'll drop off again uh slowly after after metamorphosis and um and I mean, it's been you know well demonstrated that giving us um a dose of t3 to tadpoles um uh, when they're too young uh will actually cause them to go into metamorphosis early and you know they're unlikely to survive that they probably won't have the reserves and blocking t3 formation will lead to uh, very large tadpoles which haven't gone through metamorphosis So um, we'll come back to thyroid hormones in a minute, um, but just um, briefly, um, I'm not a specialist on the immune system and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, but Xenopus has been widely um, studied for, for many years. 
in terms of immune system. And what's interesting um, in this model is that the, the larva and the tadpoles of an ancestral like system uh, and then the adults um, they have a much more complex system um, which uh, is much closer to it to um, to the system in humans and um, you know it's been well categorized as well uh, obviously which um, uh, the different elements of the immune system and at what stage of development they all develop uh, they all develop um, I'm here you can see a few slides um, with some antibody staining. So um, you can see in the Xenopus spleen, uh, the, the uh, CD8 plus cells, uh, which are in the T cell zone, the B cell zone in the middle, which has got uh, Ig plus B cells. Um, and um, another a technique that's been used a lot in the past in, in Xen with Xenopus um, is a thyrectomy, uh, th sorry, thymosectomy. <laughs> where, where uh, you can remove the thymus, um, uh, you can experimentally ablate it and um, have, you know, uh, control animals from the, the same um, egg laying uh, for immune studies. So I'll move on to a bit more what I'm familiar with. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about some of the applications of transgenesis in Xenopus. Um, interestingly, here we're just talking about the thymus. You can see it here just uh, by transparency um, on these images. Um, but um, but yeah, there's uh, there's numerous applications of transgenesis in Xenopus, and you know, in a similar way that that's really exploded in uh, in zebrafish as well. Um, you know, the most common form still is um, to use uh, egg extract um, and um, and sperm nuclei. Um, and to inject them uh, without the use of uh, meganuclease or other restriction enzymes. Um, and that works great um, as it is without needing to uh, to to use uh, what are often patented uh, you know techniques such as meganuclease. And so um, in Xenopus, we can perform both uh, germinal transgenesis. Uh, you can see on the left here, this is an adult uh, frog, obviously, uh, we're looking at ventrally. You can see more or less ubiquitous expression of GFP. Um, but there is also many tissue-specific models as well. So, I mean, here you can see uh, one here where we've really zoomed in on the, the brain. This is uh, midbrain, hindbrain, and forebrain here. Um, and then uh, the caudal nerves in the tail as well, uh, which have been specifically marked. And you know, again, I'll come on to some more specific examples of uh, what we can do with these um, a little later. Um, another example of germinal transgenesis in Xenopus, uh, again, marking the brain, also the eyes. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, uh, you know, previously people would use uh, mechanical ablation of the thymus, for example. Um, this can also be performed with transgenics now. Uh, for example, uh, here on the left, uh, uh, the transgene has been used to uh, to ablate the crystalline uh, from the eye to study uh, neuro, um, ocular degeneration. Um, on the right, we can see a transgene here with a myelin basic protein promoter driving expression of uh, EGFB tag nitro reductase. Um, which um, will then uh, specifically destroy the myelin. Uh, this promoter will express this uh, transgene in the um, in the myelin, uh, and this will be used to uh, destroy um, um, oligodendrocytes. Uh, sorry, it'll be expressing the oligodendrocytes and be used to uh, specifically ablate them and causing reduction in myelin. I'm going to come back to those models. I've got a couple of um, you know concrete examples for some of the um, the human disease models. Uh, I just want to give you a quick overview first, but I'm going to just give an example of an ecotoxicological model first, um, um, or a couple. So, um, so one famous assay, uh, which has been around a little while now, is the frog embryo teratogenicity assay, uh, Xenopus or Fetax assay. And um, this, uh, this, to some, you know, to some extent, could have been the um, 
the forerunner to some of the uh, the fish embryo toxicity assay and some of the other assays which have been developed since in, in fish. Um, it's still more or less the um, the go-to assay specifically for teratogenesis. Um, and the idea is to create a teratogenic index for the compound um, by determining the LC50 and the EC50 and then uh, dividing one by the other. Um, so basically, uh, the less toxic general toxicity there is, but the more malformations which are caused by the chemical, then uh, the higher the teratogenic uh, index and um, the more of a teratogen it's considered. Um, this is obviously to avoid cases where there may be some malformations at a concentration, uh, which is almost the lethal concentration, where obviously that's not the main or maybe not a specific mode of action, but it's not the main worry um, if it's very close to a lethal concentration uh, in any case. But in cases where, you know, there's really no lethality, but there's a lot of malformation, um, as we can see in the example um, down here, if I can move the... Uh, yeah, for benzohydrazine, uh, we can see there's, you know, with increasing concentrations, there's... Um, there's, uh, there's increasing um, severity of the malformation. And so in this assay, there's a number of different measures are made, um, uh, morphological measures, and, um, you know, in terms of body length, uh, curvature, um, weight, et cetera. And, um, and yeah, obviously, there's, there's, a, there's whole scoring charts as well for, um, for different types of malformations, such as eye development or, uh, or uh, body shape. Okay, so um, moving on, I uh, just wanted to mention some of the frog tests or some of the Xenopus tests which are involved um, in the OECD conceptual framework for the testing and assessment of endocrine disruptors. Um, it's up till now, all of the thyroid work has been done um, outside of mammals, all of the thyroid work has been done in Xenopus. Um, and so the, the framework basically... Um, can be categorized as and is categorized as five different levels. So level one's existing data and non-test information. Uh, so this is made basically literature search. Level two is in vitro assays, um, providing data about selected endocrine mechanisms or pathways. Level three is in vivo assays, providing data about selected endocrine mechanisms or pathways. Um, level four, in vivo assays, providing data on adverse effects. So this is really uh, the you know, the, the, the defining difference between level three and level four. If the assay goes long enough to be able to, for example, for the reproductive assays, actually measure a reduction in egg production or, you know, a reduction in uh, fertilization of the eggs uh, or egg survival, um, then this would be considered an adverse effect. Uh, if it's a shorter assay, which can measure an effect on one of the endocrine axes, but... Um, can't in that time frame uh, identify uh, an adverse effect, then it's level three. And then level five assays, um, basically similar to level four, but they show adverse effects, but uh, much more general, uh, uh, maybe on a whole series of uh, different endocrine or non-endocrine systems and will be carried out over uh, either full life cycles or you know, extensive um uh, periods of, of uh, the animal's life. So um, at the moment, uh, level three, there's the Zeta, the uh, Xenopus embryonic thyroid assay, and there's also uh, the amphibian metamorphosis assay. Um, and then at level four, there's uh, a kind of longer version of the amphibian metamorphosis assay where uh, there's additional endpoints which are measured called the lagged or larval amphibian growth and development assay. And um, just to give you an idea of how that fits into the development, um, so the, the Zeta is carried out at um, Eleutheroembryonic uh, life stages, so it's, they're not considered as laboratory animals. They're carried on uh, very early on in development. Uh, the AMA um, is carried out uh, over a much uh, larger um, 
space of time over 21 days instead of three days, um, terminating not far from metamorphosis. Um, and the lag that begins earlier than the Amr, it's not on this um, image, but begins uh, earlier than the Amr and then continues um, up till uh, the same point as the Amr, or, or slightly later, depending on um, uh, depending on the, the the control groups. So uh, to give you a quick example of some of the data that's generated with the uh, with the Zeta. Um, before moving on to the the uh, human models, uh, the human disease models. Um, so uh, here we looked at some uh, thyroid active pesticides identified uh, using the Zeta. Um, I'm just going to show you one today since we're, we're already covering quite a few topics. Um, and so here you can see um, two of the tadpoles which are used in the Zeta, which are transgenic expressing GFP um, in the brain. You can see a control here and then one that's been treated with thyroid hormone um, where there's a, a much higher level of um, GFP. So, oops. <laughs> so this is <laughs> this is carried out early for embryonic life stages, um, um, as mentioned earlier. So it's carried out over three days, terminating around about here. And um, the the. The kind of idea behind this was to uh, try and get a faster readout and a predictive assay for the um, to, for the results that might be obtained with the amphibian metamorphosis assay, which, as I said, 21-day exposure uh, requires morphological measurements such as weight, snout to vent length, hind limb length, uh, developmental stage, and also histopathology of the thyroid gland. So uh, for the AMA, uh, you're looking at about 70,000 euros per chemical test to, to perform it on the GLP. Um, obviously, a three-day assay in, in Xenopus embryos is considerably um, uh, considerably cheaper. Um, so the the basis of the assay is, uh, is this transgene here, uh, which is uh, integrated into the... Uh, uh, by germinal transgenesis into the uh, transgenic line. Um, and it's a THP zip promoter, which is uh, highly, the promoter of a gene which is highly regulate, upregulated by um, T3 um, during, um, during metamorphosis. Um, it's actually a transcription factor involved in metamorphosis and it's a direct thyroid response gene. So uh, when thyroid hormone um, activates the, uh, well, binds to its receptor and then activates transcription um, via the THP zip promoter, uh, then GFP is produced. And what's nice about this system is that uh, as this is really the terminal step in thyroid hormone signaling, uh, then we can actually theoretically, and we've actually demonstrated this in, in most cases, um, we can detect uh, modulation of the thyroid axis either at the level of uh, thyroid hormone transport, uh, metabolism by diiodinase enzymes, uh, clearance uh, via UDT, UDPGT in the liver, uh, obviously receptor interactions. Um, and um, and yeah, so I mean, the, the, only, the only area where we, we kind of struggle a little bit um, in some cases is uh, with synthesis. Uh, just because of these early tadpole stages, uh, there's very little thyroid hormone which is actually produced. But anywhere on, on this scheme, uh, uh, with a possible exception of synthesis, will lead to uh, an eventual uh, change in the in the signaling on on this promoter um, as the kind of terminal step. So the assay performed. Uh, I started with stage 45 embryos for three days, terminating uh, stage 48. And um, and uh, the, the embryos are placed with 10 per well in six well plates. Um, and then the chemical to be tested is tested alone at different concentrations or in the presence of thyroid hormone. And this is necessary because there's very low endogenous thyroid hormone at these life stages. Um, it's necessary to, uh, to ensure that... Um, you know, something like a thyroid reset hormone receptor antagonist or something which is altering the metabolism of thyroid hormone uh, or its transport in the blood can be 
um, can be detected, whereas in the absence of thyroid hormone, something that alters its blood transport, for example, uh, wouldn't have an effect. And uh, in the in the presence of T3, they're obviously compared to uh, uh, the T3 control, which is T3 alone. And the advantage as well of uh, performing this in embryos is that they can be uh, they can be uh, read out either. Uh, with a fluorescent plate reader in 96 well plates, as you can see here, you see one tab called for well here. Uh, they're rinsed to remove test chemical in case it's fluorescent, then anesthetized and manually placed um, dorsally on, in a 96 well plate. Um, they can also be read out by imagery or automated imagery. So you can see our, our automated imagery with a, a 96 well plate reader and the images in black and white of. Um, of um, each embryo. And the kind of results, because, you know, it, it, when you don't have the eye for it, <laughs> it can be quite difficult to to, to see uh, differences. Um, although, you know, in some cases, it's very clear the difference between, uh, you know, a low concentration and, um, and a high concentration of the test chemical. So I'm just trying to read the, the scale here. Uh, but, um, but yeah, the kind of the kind of results I'll give uh, once I convert it to numbers. Uh, these are in relative fluorescence units, and you can see here a concentration response curve to uh, T3 uh, thyroid hormone um, or thyroxine um, in in microgram per liter ranges. It went low microgram per liter range. And so, uh, as promised, here's an example with with one pesticide. Um, I won't. To uh, so show you millions uh, today, but um, but feel free to get in touch if uh, if you're curious. Um, so this is diconazole, and you can see here in the absence of T3, increasing concentrations of diconazole um, uh, give increasing fluorescence compared to the control here, uh, with significant uh, statistical significance for the highest two concentrations. And in the presence of T3, this is more obvious uh, when we control to, compared to the T3 control. It's actually a top four concentrations are statistically significant. And di diniconazole, not diconazole, diniconazole, as its name suggests, uh, is nasal um, antifungal. Um, so uh, it's a fungicide, which is... Uh, um, I don't know about everywhere in the world, but I know that it's uh, it's not permitted for use in the UK at the moment. And um, it's been shown to induce thyroid tumors in rats as well in 1993. So just to finish up on, on the ecotox models, uh, the advantage is um, that Xenopus is an excellent model for medium throughput screening. Uh, there's an ethical alternative to animal testing so if we use uh, very early life stages and that there's vastly reduced costs. Also, um, we can work in vivo, so captures a wide range of mechanisms of action. Um, and the Zeta test in particular is AFNOR and OECD validated now with eyes own progress. Uh, disadvantages for the early life stage with developing thyroid, so it can be difficult to identify some chemicals acting at this level. So um, just going to go briefly into a couple of examples of, um, of um, some of the models for human diseases. Um, so just before going into that, I just wanted to show you these slides. Um, this is um, unpublished work from uh, uh, my partner in crime and um, a fellow member of Precision Talks, David Dupesky. Uh, so this was done in a project called uh, OMP uh, that we actually managed, or David managed actually. Um, who, um, which was uh, looking at uh, uh, the use of um, early life stage Xenopus um, um, to look at um, uh, some uh, neurological diseases. Um, and so it was, a, it was a French project that David managed a few years ago. And this was some of the preliminary work um, looking into um, whether there was a functional blood-brain barrier in tadpoles and and starting to get an idea maybe of uh, of what kind of size of molecules could get through it. Um, so this was an in, in, intracardiac injection of um, FITC dextran, 2,000 kilodaltons, um, rhodamine, uh, 10 kilodaltons, 
and Dappy 350 Daltons um, in green, red, or blue. And uh, it generates some very pretty pictures, which uh, I thought you guys would want to see. Um, we can actually see the brain here in blue, which um, you remember, which was the smallest. Uh, green's the biggest. Um, and so we can see that at least the uh, at least the dappy was um, was getting into the brain. Um, it's less clear for the green and the red. Um, they definitely won't get into the brain at the same extent, uh, but it's less clear um, whether they, they were both uh, excluded or not. And here you can see a biphoton microscopy um, uh, image uh, where we can see uh, the blue seems to um, seems to be uh, here in the uh, blood-brain barrier, um, whereas uh, the red um, has been has been excluded. Now you can see the green in the neuron. So we're not really sure what that means. Um, but um, I'm going to show, show you some of the other work from uh, from this project, uh, which has been published. Um, so um, just looking into Xenopus as a, as a model for human diseases. Um, and so, I mean, what, what's nice about this model is um, the, the rapid amphibian development rate um, can allow some prediction. You know, we should always be careful what we think we can predict or not, but um, of patho pathophysiological phenomena that intervene at long term in humans. Um, so, it's you know they're relatively close to humans. Um, they they have similar res specific responses to many things, and within forty eight hours of development uh we can see homologous genes and proteins to human complex nervous system with both central and peripheral uh, cartilage will, which will later become bones um skin derma and epiderma eyes cardiovascular system and an immune system uh, which as we mentioned earlier was actually uh, um complex um what's interesting as well is uh, uh is that they they have compact myelin as well which um which um don't think uh, fish have, uh, which which makes them useful for some some of the myelin models. Um, so uh, this um, this is from Gunnison et al. Uh, two thousand and eight, and it shows um, uh, the number of conserved human drug targets and the sequence similarity. Uh, so obviously you got humans here, which are like perfect models for humans, uh, but then as we as we get further away we go through mice um chickens uh xenopus tropicalis um the the famous uh danny orario uh, zebra fish and xenopus lavis and and this representation as well i really like um where we can see um you know the the number of um conserve or the percentage of conserved human drug targets by type so we can see, for example, that uh, Xenopus tropicalis and Xenopus lavis um, are pretty good in most cases, uh, with the exception maybe of receptors, uh, where the, the, the you know there are some differences compared, and you know there's less conservation compared to humans. Um, but this is interesting, and I think it's interesting as well to keep in mind that you know um, that you know it's it's worth checking <laughs> and uh, when you don't have a phylotoxicological um approach like in precision toxin you're not testing everything on multiple animals in parallel or multiple um non-sentient an animals in in parallel then um it's worth really looking into you know how well conserved your target is um before um developing the model um as um uh, just to make sure that you, you've got the right um organism for the model um, so first of the two examples, uh, Parkinson's disease model. Uh, so this was also developed in, in Ong. Um, so um, as you'll know, uh, Parkinson's um, is, uh, is a human disease, um, which is due to a um, um, uh, breakdown in signaling from dopaminergic neurons, uh, leading to uh, shaking, rigidity, bradykinesia, um and postural instability and so uh and this can this can actually you can actually create chemical lesions in humans um um which mimic very closely um um parkinson's disease um 
and some idiots in the UK did this to themselves um, a number of years ago when they they tried to manufacture drugs in the in the garage and ended up uh, producing MPTP, which is uh, a very specific toxicant, which will um, well, I'll show you, which can cross a blood brain barrier where it's then um, uh, converted to MPP plus in glial cells, which is then uh, uptaken into dopaminergic neurons and more or less trapped inside the brain because it can't get back across the blood brain barrier, and it'll specifically kill dopaminergic neurons. Um, and so, um, so this is one way that treating um, it, um, just the mechanism by which it does this of shutting down the electron transport chain. Um, but this is a mechanism we can use um, to treat uh, xenopatapols with MPTP uh, and and simulate um, Parkinson's disease. Uh, we can then perform a behavioral analysis or evaluation uh, using uh, similar equipment to zebrafish. Uh, a zebra box or um, um, or similar equipment. So uh, in this case, um, in this case, we can see some examples of some of the traces we got. So these were untreated to control tadpoles, and tadpoles will tend to swim. It's a six well plate. Tadpoles will tend to swim around the exterior of the plate. They'll cross it. The sorry, the exterior of the well. They'll cross over the middle of the well occasionally, but they'll generally do circles around the outside. And these are some tadpoles treated with MPTP at 10 milligrams per liter. So you can see that this, you know, this could be useful to um, uh, to screen um, uh, potential therapeutics uh, that might um, slow down or, or even um, reverse in, to some extent the effects of um, uh, dopaminergic neuron loss. And so uh, as an example here, we've got um, this is a graph of uh, MPTP uh, compared to controls. Uh, so with increasing concentration of MPTP, we see a reduction in uh, swimming speed. Um, and one of the treatments for humans is uh, L-DOPA, um, <clears throat> which uh, actually um, is produced in the dopaminergic neurons. And so by it'll bypass the fact that, you know, uh, there's a loss of dopaminergic neurons by uh, by by treating with L-dopa, so uh, that can then be converted to to dopamine. And what we see here in the tadpole model is when we treat them with uh, MPTP, uh, we get a reduction in swimming speed compared to controls. Um, L-dopa alone compared to controls, uh, there's no st statistically significant difference. Uh, but then when we have L-dopa and MPTP. Then with a higher dose of L-dopa, we see a slight uh, rescue, not to some extent, uh, a slight increase in motility compared to uh, uh, MPTP alone. And um, just uh, just the last word on um, on some of the behavioral aspects. Um, there's a really nice test you can do with the Xenopus that, that I wanted to show you, which, uh, which is the dodge reflex test. Uh, there's other tests, location preference, like dark behavior. Uh, but the dodge reflex thing's um, always very interesting because the idea is uh, to place a, um, a Petri dish or, you know, a, a large dish on top of a computer screen and have dots move across the screen and uh, evaluate the ability of the tadpoles to avoid these dots. And this obviously is simultaneously measuring a large number of factors. I mean, it, uh, it's not just how fast they swim, but... Um, you know, they need to have a fully functioning uh, central nervous system because they need to be able to react rapidly um, and make decisions to dodge them. Um, they need to be have you know fully functioning signaling, um, uh, intramuscular well, muscular signaling, um, and um, yeah, and coordination. Uh, you know, eye to tail coordination, let's say. Um, or eye to fin coordination, but yeah, I want to show you this because this, um, you know, this this um, this has been used by some of our collaborators on this project, and um, I think it's very interesting. I'll show you a couple of times because it's not easy to follow the first time. But um, the dots are going to move up the screen, and there's a couple of tadpoles. This guy's interesting to watch if you're going to fix on one, and um, you can see them gradually, um, well, rapidly avoiding the dots. Okay. 
So uh, I'll just run that a second time just um, for anyone who missed it. So, yeah, the, the guy who starts being the top left is interesting if you didn't watch it in the first time. So um, yeah, last example for the for the um, human disease models, um, and this was developed in the same project as well, um, in collaboration with obviously with uh, the other members of projects, in particular um, the guys at the um, Petit Salpetre um, uh, Hospital in Paris, uh, where they work specific well, they work on um, on multiple sclerosis. And um, so, as I said before, amphibians have compact myelin, similar to that found in humans. They also have an adaptive immune system, uh, making them an interesting model for multiple sclerosis. Um, and um, here you can see the the model that I, I mentioned briefly earlier. So we we can specifically express this transgene uh, EGFP tag nitrate reductase, um, um, and then in the oligodendrocytes. And we can see where it's trying because of the GFB. We can just double check that you know it's expressing in the right place. You can see them in the uh, tail here. Um, you can also see them in the brain. Um, and this nitrate reductase enzyme, when we treat um, the uh, when we treat the embryos with the um, metronidazole, which is a uh, protoxicant, um, they'll specifically. The, the metronidazole will specifically be converted into a, um, a powerful toxin in, in the cells expressing nitro reductase. Um, so in this case, specifically, uh, we can ablate specifically a, a particular cell, uh, cell type. And what we see is um, here in green, you can see the oligodendrocytes. Um, so in an untreated and treated animal, you can see there's far less here than, than there are here. Uh, you can see this again when it's zoomed that there's far less on the right, um, and you can see here when we when we um, uh, when we treat with uh, when we uh, stain for caspase three, uh, you can see that uh, even these three here, which which are still present, are actually undergoing apoptosis. So, um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, the kind of functional model. Here you can see a number of oligodendrocytes per optic nerve. Um, so control animals, uh, once we've treated with metronidazole, um, and then um, three hours after we stop treatment, you can see there's still um, there's still a, a reduction here, an even further reduction in the metronidazole treated. And then in, in uh, these animals, where they've been co-treated with uh, resalagine, uh, which is... Um, which is um, a, a known drug to to uh, which can increase um, oligodendrocyte proliferation. We can see that they they've started to um, to repopulate. So this remyelination model is useful tool for screening potential therapeutics. Transparent nature of the model uh, means that demyelination remyelination can be observed in vivo. Um, and um, you know and we. We're, we're really happy about this, to be honest. Uh, we've, um, um, apart from um, some of the model development at the start, we've really uh, passed it over. <laughs> or, you know, uh, we've we've not had a, a lot of input recently, but but we know that uh, it has been used extensively at the hospital uh, by this research group um, to screen um, quite a number of different um, uh, current and potential future uh, uh, medications. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's a nice concrete model of, uh, um, you know, something that, uh, that can come about from uh, this kind of collaboration. Um, and then just, uh, some general conclusions, um, and, um, then we can go to questions. So, um, just generally on the Xenopus, um, hopefully I'll have more or less convinced you. <laughs> Uh, the, this uh, is an extremely well studied uh, model. The, I think it probably can be true it's a tetrapod. Uh, but, um, you know, Xenopus have been studied widely for well over 100 years. Um, they're phylogenetically, they're relatively close to mammals. 
uh, that there's many genetic tools available. Uh, we can do many of the same things that, that we can do with uh, with zebrafish, for example. Um, the the Eleuthero embryonic life stages are compliant with a three hours approach. Uh, and what's, what's nice as well is we can really produce hundreds to thousands of embryos per clutch uh, where um, they make nice controls as well because the, they're all obviously from the same clutch, so they're all uh, siblings. And we can greatly reduce the use of mammals um, as well as adult fish and amphibians uh, by taking this kind of approach of using um, early life stage uh, xenopus in the same way we do with the fish. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. That was amazing. Thank you. Indeed, I, I think it should be mandatory to always start this presentation with the historical view of these models because it's so cool to see how, how we learn how to do this. I completely agree, uh, Matteo, and, and I really enjoyed hearing the story of uh, Lancelot uh, and his Birmingham origins and uh, and how he really kind of was groundbreaking by the use of, uh, of Xenopus and our understanding of environment uh, gene interactions. Yeah, yeah, I thought that. Uh... Thought you might like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I ask you to stop sharing the screen so we can see the face yeah, of people if sure, they have sure. questions? Thanks. Um, so yeah, if you have any question, you can either write it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, it would be nice if you open your camera as well, so we see. But that's up to you. It's nice to see uh, David joining us today. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, John. Hi. So any question for Andrew? I can start with one otherwise. Uh, because you show it that indeed it's it's amazing that some of your tests are actually OECD guidelines. So that's super cool that they are being validated. And I just wonder if you have a general idea of how 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 was the path for you to actually go to the validation? What happened there? What was because I I realized that there are different ways where you can yeah. end up in that sense. How how it worked for you? Yeah. Um yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, when, when we started up, um, the idea really, um, we, we weren't really thinking of OECD validation. We were thinking more of making predictive tests that could be used for pre-screening um, uh, to maybe prioritize uh, chemicals for OECD validated tests. And um, as we went along and we saw that there was, you know, a great amount of interest and a, a big you know, uh, and yeah, there's a great amount of interest from industry in these kind of tests that, um, you, you know, um, we were highly encouraged um, to to go ahead because um, uh, when they start seeing some of the results coming from, from their screening studies, uh, then they're obviously starting to think, well, you know, if this could be the definitive study, then, um, then uh, that would be great too. And so it was... It was a struggle for the first test. Um, I mean, I'm sure David can tell you more. Probably it was him who validated the uh, the zeta assay. Um, it's it's getting easier. I think it was uh, the zeta assay was um, before the FET as well. Um, so I mean, it was you know um, as far as I'm aware, um, apart from the FETAX assay, maybe um, it was um, you know it was one of the very first uh, embryonic assays. Um, it was also, as far as I'm aware, in a whole organism, the first transgenic assay, uh, which caused, um, you know, uh, th there were a lot of questions which needed resolving at an OECD level um, before they, they were really um, convinced um, that we should, you know, they could go ahead. Um, now that's been clarified, then, you know, th there's... There's the, the easy assay that's been uh, validated afterwards, and then the radar assay. Uh, we've got the reactive assay in, in the last stages of OECD validation at the moment. So, um, um, so yeah, it, it's definitely made things easier. Um, but um, 
but yeah, he's just talking. He's long. I think we're looking at eight or nine years mm. for the zebra assay. Um, yeah, we go down to about six for the radar assay. Um, but was it something that you jumped straight to that, or it was more like, okay, first in the French maybe regulatory environment, and then pop, 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 we just go there, or it was. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, it just followed a kind of logical um, progression. I mean, um, you know, first we validated the tests internally um, until we were happy with them. And, you know, we had standardized protocols and we tested a, a lot of reference compounds. Um, then, um, then for the, not for the radar, but for the reactive and the uh, Zeta, we, we have a uh, French normative document, uh, but specifically on water testing with environmental water samples. Um, and then, then you know, then we decided to try uh, OECD validation with the, and and we're actually uh, we're actually in the middle of ISO validation at the moment. Uh, uh, David is to a large part, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. So um, so yeah, the ISO validation will be the kind of international update on the environmental samples testing, I guess. Uh, which is the uh, the, the French um, norms at the moment. Cool. John. Uh, Matteo. Uh, Andrew, I'm fascinated by model species, of course, uh, and, the, and the history that you provided is a history that's shared with all model species. Um, one of the fascinating things that considering the diversity of animal life, uh, you know, we can count them on almost one or two hands. Yeah. Uh, and yet, for every major clade, we have a model. Um, what I see in Xenopus is very similar to what I've seen, for instance, in, in, in Daphne or, or others. Um, it's quite obvious that it's the right tool for its biology. But then in Daphne, we always have the, the choice between Daphne Pulex or Daphne Magna. Um, in Xenopus, there's you know, work being done on Tropicalis or, or, or um, um, uh, Lavis, why the distinction between the two? Are they complementary? Are they offering different things? Are they the same? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, the advantage um, Tropicalis was really kind of taking off um, around the time I started my PhD, and I, I did my PhD on the thyroid system of Tropicalis, um, and it seemed like a logical next step because they're smaller, they grow faster. Uh, you know, Lavis for a female, um, maybe not our place. We've got things pretty well optimized at our place. We might be slightly under a year at our place, but often it'll take over a year to have a, a reproductively mature female in Lavis, whereas you can do that in maybe five months in, in Tropicalis. Um, they're much smaller as well, so they require less space. They lay way more, a lot more eggs per laying, you know, it could be like 5,000 or more, you know per laying, uh, maybe up to, yeah, high thousand, you know, less than 10,000, but a lot. Um, the major advantage that is talked about at the time was that um, Tropicalis are diploid and um, Xenopus latus uh, are tetraploid, uh, which complicates the genetics a little bit. Depending on what you're doing, if you're if you're including a transgene in the genome, it really doesn't make any difference. Um, but yeah, if you're studying the genetics, um, and actually the Tropicalis genome was being sequenced before the latest one, so um, at the time it made a lot of sense. Um, uh, my experience with Tropicalis was similar to a lot of other people's that I've spoken to that um, because they grow at a higher temperature, um, they're much more susceptible to disease. Um, there have been whole colonies that have been wiped out um, in a matter of weeks uh, when a disease has got in. Um, and so, um, and they're also maybe, I've less experience with that, but they're maybe a little bit less robust with chemical treatments as well. Um, and so, um, um, so yeah, I mean, we, you know, we've specific, we've stuck to Xenopus Lavis just because, um, you know, the idea of our models is for chemical testing and, and also environmental sample testing and you know some of those are wastewater influent or effluent and um i'm really not sure how well uh tropicalis would survive that so. thank you that's very helpful uh, i think we have a question yes uh hello andrew yeah uh, i'm pusha i'm a new assistant professor in 
uh, Universe Birmingham in prison pharmacology. Uh, yeah, and thanks for the introduction of a very amazing and impressive platform of frogs. So uh, I'm very looking forward to have opportunity to collaborate with you in the future. Uh, so I have a, a several questions for you. Uh, why okay. follow up uh, John's question? So, uh, so I, I was wondering. So how is the sensitivity and the specificity, the specificity of frogs uh, in chemical toxic testing? Uh, like the you know their point of departure. So compared to other uh, species, for example, zebrafish and daphnia. And my second question is that so uh, you are from the institution of watch frog. So as I was wondering, so have. Uh, can we watch the frog in the, in the real environment? So, for example, we capture the frogs from the environment. Are there good uh, environment monitoring models? Uh, so we can analyze the chemical residues in frogs, and we can analyze the uh, like the molecular response in frogs. So we can do some real environment monitoring. So, what do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, we've uh, just to answer the last bit first. I mean. Um, we don't capture them in the wild, but I mean, there are people capturing them in the wild in France uh, year round because there's a, a wild population in the south of France where um, somewhere apparently the legend is they were deliberately released from um, a lab when it shut down and some of the animal staff uh, deliberately released them. But in any case, there's a, you know, there's, there's a quite considerable population in the southwest of France. Uh, which uh, people spend a lot of time and effort trying to capture and eradicate every year because they're replacing the local frogs. Um, the um, one of our old collaborators, uh, Nicola Pole, uh, Nicholas Pole, is um, um, who used to actually be in this office. This was his office when they shared a building with us. Um, he's an academic researcher. He's over in Africa right now, I think, um, studying the. Uh, uh, gastrointestinal flora of uh, Xenopus species. Um, so certainly, the, the you know, there's a lot of people still go out in the wild and and capture them. Uh, we avoid that for many reasons. Firstly, we don't need to. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to go over there and see them in the wild, but um, unfortunately, um, work isn't going to pay for that. Um, and um, and also, yeah, obviously, we don't want to introduce any any wild caught ones um, to our place to avoid bringing any diseases in. Um, and then you mentioned the uh, specificity. Um, yeah, the sensitivity, yeah, compared to other species. So, like, yeah, just well, for general, and you can also take example for like thyroid hormone yeah. Uh, activity, yeah. Well, I mean, with thyroid hormones, um, I mean, apart from the mammalian models, I mean, there aren't really any other models at the moment. I mean, we've just, um, we've just developed a fish model, uh, which we were... Um, we should one of my colleagues elise uh, pass uh, gave a presentation on that ctac last year um so we've got a transgenic midaka model now um for thyroid hormone uh, it's interesting what we're seeing with that because we can compare with that because you know um we've got them both um but i mean um there, there really aren't any of ricotox models for thyroid hormone uh, other than xenopus um so, um, but comparing with the fish model, um, it's not the same transgene, and as you, and it's not the same part of the pathway either. Uh, once thyroglobulin, which is more um, revealing uh, diff, uh, alterations in feedback um, from circulating levels of T3, and then the other one is the THB zip promoter, which is um, and you know a terminal signaling step. And so as you'd expect, I mean, you know, it, it depends on the mechanism of action. Uh, they're actually both quite complementary because we're seeing increased sensitivity for some modes of action with one model uh, and then for other modes of action with the other, um, which is uh, which is nice. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the one thing we have struggled with, yeah, that, that might be an interesting example. One thing we did struggle with with Xenopus was to achieve any kind of usable um, um, sensitivity for estrogens and androgens. Uh, we didn't actually try very hard with androgens, but um, uh, which is why we use fish models. Uh, again, we have Nidaka models for those. And um, in my uh, in my opinion, and there's a few publications, like some really old stuff from the 70s, uh, which you know, from very good people back in the 70s who, who were a bit ahead of the time, um, which seems to be suggesting that uh, a lot of the genes are, are uh, 
inactivated possibly by methylation uh, wasn't really something they looked into at the time but that they can be um, unlocked by thyroid hormone so um, I mean certainly for the reproductive assays um, uh, is it like before metamorphosis since xenopus Zen aren't reproductively act active before they metamorphosize then um, uh, then yeah I think the uh, uh, I think there's a greatly reduced sensitivity for estrogens and androgens. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So uh, in the future, we are planning to using transatomics platform to identify molecular level-based point of departure of chemicals, and we want to we are, we are happy we are happy to uh, compare the sensitivity between different species, and we yeah so yeah we are, I'm looking forward to use, you know if, if we can use frogs so to compare with between zebra fish, daphnia, and even human cells. Yeah. Yeah, I think what'll be interesting there as well is to look at the, uh, you know, the coverage of different modes of action because, um, you know, you'll find species which are more sensitive for one thing or another, but um, you'll also find that, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, there's compact myelin in the frogs and uh, there's a much more developed immune system compared to fish as well. So it's it, there'll be some modes of action which you, uh, which, you know, and it, it's kind of looking at the differences as well, which will help you reveal it. Thanks. Any other question for Andrew? If not, well, thank you. Andrew, again, and thank you everybody for, for tuning in, uh, even though we are at the end of July, so it's very nice that so many of you decided to join. I hope you are about to go on holiday. Uh, uh, we are going to be back uh, after, uh, again, a little bit of a hiatus because now there is August, and as you know, there is Eurotox, there is ASPIS, there is a lot of different congresses that are upon us, so uh, we are going to be back in October. Uh, with the next Cafe Scientific, so just stay tuned on on the website uh, uh, and the social of Precision Talks, and you will see. We will put the information as soon as possible. If you are in the off chance that you are not part of Precision Talks, well, please go and check that project because it's the best project ever. Uh, so PrecisionTalks.org uh, is the website. John? Matteo, I also wanted to say uh, thank you very much to uh, Andrew. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I'm going to avoid the question. Um, if you, have you seen the movie Top Gun Maverick, um, when uh, Tom uh, Cruise meets with his his old compatriot, and they have this tender moment, and then his old compatriot asks the question, "So, who's the better pilot?" And Tom Cruise comes back and says, "Don't ruin a wonderful moment." So I'm not going to ask the question, which one is the best model system, but I'm actually convinced. <laughs> that Xenopus is right up there, right up there among the very best in terms of telling us something uh, meaningful in terms uh, of a biology tied to environmental exposure. So thank you very much for that. And finally, I did receive some nice compliments from people, un unsolicited, that they're really enjoying uh, going on our websites and to, uh, and to see these uh, recorded um, sessions as well. And so they are actually lasting quite nicely in terms of uh, a resource for the research community. And so I'm very glad to see that this one's going to be added to, the, to our growing library. So thank you, uh, Matteo. Well, t t you, you are doing the job. We are not doing much. <laughs> it's all the scientists like Andrew that makes this presentation. But yes, it will be uploaded on their website uh, in, in the next weeks, and you can find them all back there. Uh, I think I got to put on the on the chat all the, the, the website for Precision Talks and ASPIS, the, the cluster with the other European projects. So if you want some information, you can find them there. Uh, otherwise, I, I thank you again, Andrew, and everybody else for, for tuning in. And I hope to see you in the next Café Scientifique in October. So see you next time. Bye.